Hello, my name is Tim Turnus, and I am the Director of Programming and the St. John's Bible at the Hill Museum and Manuscript Library, more commonly known as Himmel. Himmel is located on the St. John's Abbey and University campus in Collegeville, Minnesota. Now, like many of you, I find myself working from home these days due to COVID-19, and since I can't continue my programming around the country, I decided to put together a series of mini programs to share with you via Himmel at Home. Ancient Methods, Modern Results is a series of short talks which will take a look at the historical roots of the tools, methods, and materials used in the making of the St. John's Bible. And today's topic is taking a look at scribes and scripts, the heart of the St. John's Bible. If you're unfamiliar with the St. John's Bible, you can visit the website shown on the screen in front of you. At its heart, the St. John's Bible is a calligraphic project. Now, while the illuminations often take center stage, as you see here in this beautiful picture, it is the writing that continues page by page in unobtrusive and consistent fashion that makes the project, makes the bulk of the project. And unlike the illuminations, the writing has a very different ethos. It's that of servitude. It doesn't try to draw attention to itself, but by its very magnitude, it does draw attention to themselves. In fact, calligraphers often see themselves or describe themselves as servants of the text. So today we're going to focus primarily on the different scripts in the St. John's Bible and those people who brought those scripts to life. Now, before we go any further, I want to clarify one thing, and that's this. The word font is often used by people when they take a look at a piece of printed page, no matter what and how it was done. Well, the word font is not really a word that should be used with calligraphy. The word font is a word of the printing industry, and it describes the weight, width, and style of a particular typeface within a letter, a set of letter forms. In calligraphy, you don't want to use the word font. If you're describing the word hand, the word right on the page, you can use hand, script, lettering, letter forms, almost anything but the word font. According to Christopher Calderhead, the author of Illuminating the Word, which is kind of the basic Bible about the making of the St. John's Bible, he describes the scripts of the St. John's Bible in two ways, those that are expressive and those that are craft scripts. Now, the, the, the expressive scripts, the scribes have a lot of freedom with those. They don't need to be customized to a certain letter form, and they can suit a context. The craft scripts are kind of the workhorses of the St. John's Bible, but Christopher describes them as they may be workhorses, but they are definitely thoroughbreds. So let's take a look and explore the couple of difference. This page here really does a nice job of differentiating between the two. You see the beautiful workhorse solid, solid text, and then you see these unbelievably gorgeous elements of all text and words but they are expressive, they are very decorative. These are known as special treatments. And the special treatments in the Bible are designed to highlight text. Think of it as going through the Bible or going through a textbook and you're reading it and you have a yellow highlighter. You're highlighting passages that strike you, that speak to you, that you want to remember, that are important to many different people. The same thing with the Catholics of the St. John's Bible. We simply use a fancier highlighter. On this page from Luke's Gospel, we have the Magnificat, the Benedictus, and the Glory to God, beautifully highlighted. And look at the elegance and dancing of those, of those texts across the page. Example, another example is the Our Father from Matthew. You can see how the body of the text is there, and then all of a sudden, the Our Father is highlighted to draw it out and draw attention to itself. And that is the purpose of expressive texts. They bring it all out. The expressive text can also be found inside illuminations. Take a look at the illumination for the Nativity, the Gospel of Luke. And here you see the text actually becomes part of the artwork on the inside. Or, as in Thomas Ingmeyer's work, sometimes the text itself becomes the artwork. And again, the expressive texts don't need to follow stringent rules. The artist has a lot of freedom or the calligrapher has a lot of freedom to work with them. For example, in the Ten Commandments, artist Thomas Ingmeyer wanted the letter forms to look as if they were carved, as if they were weight. One of the comments he once made is he said, 
I was creating an image of the Ten Commandments, not the Ten Suggestions. So I wanted these letters to have weight. And so this is the only area in the St. John's Bible where the letters are stenciled. We wanted them to look like they had been cut out of stone. Another one of Thomas's pieces is this beautiful one for the Beatitudes in which the gold lettering dances across the page. And if you take a look hidden inside on the, on the right side, you see this detail that actually is blessed, 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 blessed. The letters become the art form and are very expressive of the celebration happening within the Beatitudes. Along with the expressive scripts, you have the workhorse scripts, the craft scripts, the scripts that the artists themselves, the calligraphers themselves, bring to life on the page after page after page. And this page here from Jeremiah is a nice example of how it kind of flows. You see here a blending in of this elegant passage on the right over here, which is a special treatment with an expressive text, but then you see the workhorse scripts here. You see the prose, you see the poetry lining the pages. In the St. John's Bible, prose is justified left and right. It's a very solid script. It's very consistent, and it's designed to create a, a grid work for the artworks. It also allows the words to have enough weight to stand up next to the beautiful artworks. In the St. John's Bible, the prose is always justified left and right. Poetry is another form of workhorse or craft script, and those words are written slightly italicized, a slightly smaller than the script, and they're not justified on the, on the right side of the page, of, of the margin. Let's take a closer look at these. You can see they are basically variations on the same theme. The beautiful script of the prose with its justification uses these paragraph markers, we call them kites, because we did not want to have an indentation and a white line space at every paragraph like modern printed work. Again, Donald Jackson wanted to have this solid column of text running through the page. So these beautiful little colored markers simply tell you what paragraph, where a paragraph breaks, and they're often tied in with the margin number on the side. A red number with a red kite, a blue number with a blue kite. And here you can see how the prose script, the poetry script, excuse me, is a little bit thinner and italicized. Also another workhorse are the tiny footnotes that appear on every, almost every single page. These footnotes correspond to um, translation challenges or translation questions in, in scripture. You'll see here a, ta a tiny letter will appear above a word. Here is A and that in God sows or that is not pitied or so on. Or here it says in Hebrew, it would have been rise up from. In Greek or in Hebrew, it would have used the word brothers. These give areas where there has been translation differences from different tra transit translations of the Bible. And you will find that elegant, tiny, tiny script is also handwritten, another workhorse on every single page of the Bible. Another craft script you will notice at the beginning and endings of several sections is a decorative script. Here you see the beginning of the Gospel of John with a decorative all capital letter, majuscule, and then transferring into the standards prose script. Over here, you see the same thing, Joe's with this beautiful decorated section, and then transitioning into the prose script. If you find them at the beginning, sometimes you find them at the end. De decorative scripts at the beginning are known as insipid, or some pronounce it insipid. And they start or mark the beginning. If they're found at the end of the passage, they'd be explicit, and it's the closing of the text. And quite often in medieval manuscripts, those markings at beginning, those inshipits and ex explicits were used to kind of demark a text as well. Along with the workhorse scripts is the beautiful variety of capital letters and lettering styles that fill the book headings throughout the St. John's Bible. And just do yourself a favor sometime and page through them and take a look at the variety and elegance. Look at these just small samples that we see here. 
Donald Jackson designed them all, and the background textures are almost as beautiful as the lettering themselves. Another thing where you have the craft scripts are the, is the complete magnitude of drop capitals that Donald Jackson designed and put throughout the entire Bible. You will not find any two that are the same, and there are truly hundreds of them. Some of them are very simple to very elegant and grand, and here's an O done in all 24 karat gold. Sometimes there are variations on the theme. Here are some W's, some T's, and P's, and R's. And then if you take a look at the magnitude, just to give you an idea, historical books in just that volume alone, Donald Jackson had to design 306 rock capitals. 79 of those were the letter T. Sit at home tonight and figure out, you know, 79 different ways to make a letter T look interesting and attractive. And that was just one volume. They, Donald Jackson actually had to design several hundred letter T's in the St. John's Bible to make the variety and beauty all the way through. So just one volume, 306 decorative capitals. So the scripts of the St. John's Bible, like, like centuries before, were created and put on the page by, of course, calligraphers, that servant of the text. And if you think about the stereotype of a calligrapher, you have a bald-headed old scribe working in a monastery writing up the Bible for monks. Hmm. Not much has changed. There's Donald Jackson, the principal scribe, the artistic director of the St. John's Bible. The St. John's Bible, if you've listened to any of my other lectures, was his idea. He came up with the idea, and he is by far the artistic director and the visionary behind the entire project. Now, Donald Jackson works on the shoulders of a whole host of scribes that came before him. And we happen to know quite a bit about medieval scribes because of the work of Benedictines to pull out and, and catalog and research colophons. A colophon is a part of a book that was, that was often put into a book toward the back, sometimes in the front, but most often in the back, and not every book had one. But a colophon described the making of that object, who wrote it, how long it took, how it was done, any challenges. Sometimes there were even little personal quips about the scribe, him or herself. And in certain cases, the scribe's name, occupation, because they weren't all scribes, all, all just only calligraphers, were also listed. Both men and women were scribes, and they were, we often think of them as only monastic, but there really were a lot of professional scribes that did it as a job, maybe on the side, or as a, a main, main job. It's kind of interesting when you take a look at this list, we know the names of 19,000 medieval scribes. We probably don't even know that, that the names of that many modern scribes, if you think about it today. The ancient scribes worked in a very traditional studio setting. Uh, medieval scriptoria had roles that were very well defined. The scribes and illuminators worked in a very kind of well-established system. There may be an assistant in the, in the studio and the scriptorium that did all the ruling or the putting the lines on the page. Another scribe, of course, would have done only text writing. A rubricator may have added headings and versal capitals at the start of chapters or other divisions. And illuminators or um, artists that would do, one section would do marginalia, another would do major artworks. And the jobs were really broken down very carefully. Well, Donald Jackson put together a modern scriptorium, but he couldn't follow the traditional medieval scriptorium. That's, that's dead, it doesn't apply to today. So Donald Jackson had to put together a contemporary team. Donald hired the scribes and illuminators, and he had now to find a way to work with them collaboratively. Um, he could not fall back on that medieval model because as I said earlier, it was dead. So he had to put together this team that you see in front of him, 23 people that would work together for almost 15 years to create this one work of art. Of that 23 people, seven of them, Donald being one of them, did the work, the workhorse work, the writing of the black lettering. Let's take a look at them individually and some of their, and some of their lettering that they have done. As I mentioned, Donald Jackson. Donald Jackson is the artistic director, the visionary behind the entire project. At the age of 20, 
Donald was appointed as a visiting lecturer at the, camp, at the Camberwell College of Art in London. Imagine being 20 years old and being brought in as an expert, as a lecturer. He was, he was a member of the fellow, he was, a, he was elected as a fellow of, of the Society of Scribes and Illuminators, a very pre prestigious group. And he is considered one of the world's foremost Western scribes. Donald Jackson's hand, if you take a look at it, there's just a remarkable consistency and dignity into his hand. Donald Jackson is a master artist. He knows the craft, he knows the mechanics, which allows him to work on the expressiveness. That was the goal that Donald had to, to do. He had to serve as the master teacher to a degree. The scribes he hired were already professional, so he had to put together a studio system where these experts were kind of working under a master artist. And an atelier, if you, if you think about it that way, as, as an old art studio term. And as a, as a result, the scribes put together or gained a real strong group identity, different than the illuminators, because they were all working individually. The scribes had to work together. And it was Donald's job to make their script look unified, but also allow them the dignity of the fact that they were master artists and they knew their craft. Donald's job was to make them sing. Sue Houghton was one of these scribes, and she basically traveled all over the world as a young child. She, she moved quite often, and she trained primarily as a teacher. She was a primary teacher, and she studied in Roehampton. And originally, she failed her very first calligraphy class in school. She retook took it and then ended up staying to, on to get an honors degree. And she originally trained as a letter cutter in carving stone letters. She too was a member of the scribes and illuminators. And when she describes her work with the St. John's Bible, she said, I found it very freeing. Probably the most freedom she's ever experienced in her work. She said that surprised her. At the start, she had a lot of doubts. She thought, oh, this is not going to work. It's going to be far too demanding. But she discovered that it wasn't the writing. If you take a look at her writing, her writing is gorgeous. Again, so consistent. She said it wasn't the writing that was the issue. She knew how to do lettering, but she discovered it was her training with a metal pen that was the problem. And the St. John's Bible used a quill. And once she had started to work with the quill and master it, she said lettering became a delight because that quill becomes an extension of the hand. She found the work of the project very rewarding. And in the end, she also found the ending of the work very hard. She mourned its completion. Susie Leeper is another one of the artists that joined the team. And she joined the team in a second wave of artists that were calligraph calligraphers that were invited to be part of the project. She was born in Glasgow, and she has spent a great deal of her, of her work time in working in publications. She worked at the British Museums and has a long career in publishing. And she found herself highly influenced by moving to Hong Kong in the 1980s. And she loves the Asian letter forms, the Western calligraphy, was also studied in Hong Kong. And then she continued when she came back to the United States or to, to Edinburgh. Um, she was invited to become part of the second wave of calligraphers. And the training, she said, and all of her career in publishing and her work with Asian arts and so on was by far the most difficult thing she'd ever done. She said when she was brought in, she said we had a first week in Wales and the second week at home. Then we came back for a third week in Wales of training and then a fourth week at home and the fifth week back in Wales before she was even hired. This was the training period. So it was a month, five weeks of training and it was so difficult. In the end, she said she was brought on and settling into the script for her took quite a while. It's a very difficult hand. And, but she said she loves the fact that working on the St. John's Bible has, has given her personal, her personal work um, a sense of freedom because it really grew her confidence. She says, now when I do things, I ask myself, would I show this to Donald? And if the answer is yes, then she says she's got it. She thought of the project was very meditative in her work. She's not a religious person, she says, but the act of writing these words was quite meditative. Sally Mae Joseph 
she started at the very beginning working with Donald Jackson part time and ended up being the studio manager in the very early days of the project. In fact, it was an entire year before she did any writing on the St. John's Bible. Um, for, for Sally, she actually moved to Wales to work on the project. But she gets her, she credits her use of the tools and how she understands how to make the tools work to her father. She talks about her, her dad that was a mechanic and a, and a DIY expert. And she said, I worked with him and he taught me the feel and respect of the tool. She began her calligraphy career by taking a drawing class at the British, at the British Museum and ended up going into the manuscript section of the British Library, which was then part of the British Museum. And she said, the first time I saw that uh, uh, an ancient manuscript, she said, the black ink just spoke to me. And she was hooked. She began by taking evening calligraphy classes and ended up going to Roehampton to get a, a diploma and is also a fellow of the Scribes and Illuminators. She got started on the project when she saw a picture of the very first page Donald did, which is the genealogy of Matthew. And it was printed in the Daily Telegraph, a newspaper in England. And she wrote to Donald Jackson after that. She said, you know, if you ever need the services of a humble scribe, I'm here. Donald called her after he received that letter and said, join me. And that's how she became one of the calligraphers and of course, studio manager for the project. And again, look at the lettering. She has a very bold, a very a much heavier hand than some people, some of the other scribes have, but it's still so consistent and elegant. Brian Simpson. Brian Simpson actually made his living, uh, his career in printing. So he would have used the word font in his, in his um, just daily work. He would produce hand lettering that would be later on mechanically reproduced. He was a typographer for many years and he had been retired for a year already from the printing industry when Donald called him in. Brian was a, kind of a freelance calligrapher on the side and Donald knew him and he would every once in a while give him uh, um, kind of odd jobs that he would have backing up for him and so on. When it came time for Brian to join the team, he said he found the script quite difficult and it took longer than he thought to master it. Especially, he said, when he made those mistakes, he had a scrape and he said one time he came very close to putting a hole in the page as he was scraping away one of his many, one of his mistakes. It took him weeks to master the quill. And he said, getting it just right was the biggest challenge, especially when you were cutting that quill. Now, Brian did all of the chapter numbers and small crosses and things that marked the, the pages. And he said the numbers were particularly challenging, especially that number eight. He said, I hated that one as well. He truly missed the project. And he, was, he said when it finished, it was quite a wrench because they became a real close team. And Donald has the ability, he said, to draw out more from you than you thought you had in you. That's the, boy, the hallmark of an excellent leader or master teacher as well. Angela Swan also started the project in that second wave. She joined with Susie Leeper. And Angela worked for Donald in, the early, in, his, in her early days. She's too studied at Roehampton in, in London. And right after her degree, she was given the opportunity to work for Donald as his assistant for three years. And she said it was a very busy commercial place at that time. And then eventually she left Donald to start a calligrapher, an independent studio on her own. And she ended up just being a few miles from Donald Jackson's home. She said, the Bible script is very tricky. She said, it's actually quite complex. But for her, she said, the working with a quill was a big challenge. In fact, you've heard that a lot from the scribes. The quill was a big challenge. She said, there were days, because it changes from day to day, she said, there were days where she said, I hardly got any writing done at all because I'd be up and down, recutting and cutting and trying to get the quill to work right, just right. She said the next day it would work perfectly and run very smoothly. She said it was, it was, that was the most challenging part for her. She loved Donald's charisma and, and his impish humor. She said, that's what kind of makes the project live within us as well. One of the things that she says is that the St. John's Bible has given her a new confidence. She said, I now take on 
more complicated commissions than they ever would have done before this because it has given her confidence within her own writing. And you'll hear that from a lot of scribes saying the same type of thing as well. Now, Izzy Pludwinski did not do the English lettering in the St. John's Bible. He did the elegant and beautiful Hebrew script. Now, Izzy talks about the fact that um, he was raised in Brooklyn and got his lettering start by taking a calligraphy class at the Y on 92nd Street in Manhattan. And he found the Hebrew calligraphy quite elegant and he wanted to work with the Hebrew script. But he said, I was a long haired hippie at the time. And he said, who from the Orthodox tradition would train me? And so that's when he ended up taking that class at the Y. And eventually back in Jerusalem, which is where he lives now, he took private classes. And after three months, he wrote out the book of Esther as his very first thing. And he said that was the perfect thing to write because the name of the divine does not, uh, does not appear in the book of Esther. And he said, so it was a perfect thing for me to write because you don't have to follow some of those very strict rules for writing that. To him, he said, the writing of the St. John's or the doing the Hebrew lettering in the St. John's Bible, he said, really was just a job, a prestigious job, but it was just a job. The best part, he said, was working in the collaborative team with Donald. And in fact, when he was first asked to do this, he wasn't sure if he should. He said, I had to carefully could think about this. And he said, it's not a simple thing for a nice Jewish boy to write a Christian Bible. And he said, I, he, he approached his rabbi and he said, should I be beautifying something which, whose beliefs do not jibe with, with my own? And his rabbi said to him, you should do this and make it as beautiful as you possibly can. And Izzy's Hebrew script is very elegant. The challenge for Izzy is that his words are in isolation. The scribes doing the bulk of the lettering can develop a cadence, a rhythm that comes from row after row, line after line of writing the text. Izzy had to develop that within a very short and individual like staccato points all the way through the Bible. Again, he loved working with Donald and the fact that Donald as a master artist completely trusted his team and mostly his team's abilities. Take a look at these six hands, the six body, the six major hands. I took three lines of text just randomly and put them together. And you can see the body of the lettering is identical. You have some difference in weight or pressure. Susie has a pretty heavy hand. You take a look, so does Brian. But their forms, their angle, their size are beautifully matched. There's a consistency. However, you do see variations and you should. These are written by human hands. It's not mechanical. To disguise the fact that there are differences between the calligraphers, any two pages of script that are going to be open side by side in the St. John's Bible are always done by the same calligrapher. That way, when you've turned the page, your eye have your eye will have forgotten any slight differences and it all appears identical. And do that sometime if you have a reproduction book or come to the gallery and look at page after page after page after page. It's hard to tell where one scribe ended and a new one started. Every two page spread is by the same calligrapher, except for one page. And that one page is in the book of letters and revelation. It's in 1 Corinthians. This is the only two-page spread in the St. John's Bible where all six major calligraphers wrote on the same page. And if you just look at it, it really is hard to tell the difference. But look at the tails. Look at the ascenders and descenders. Look at the darkness and the pressure. It's pretty much the same, but there are slight differences in pressure. And you should, again, be able to tell the difference. These are written by hand. As Donald Jackson says, every letter that comes out on the St. John's Bible starts in your toes and comes out your hands. And what's also unique about this page, this two-page spread in 1 Corinthians 9 is the only place where the calligraphers have signed their work. Take a look down here at this little colorful box section. And what you have 
are the six calligraphers' marks. Sally Mae Joseph, Angela Swan, Sue Houghton, Brian Simpson, Susie Leeper, and Donald Jackson. The six pairs of hands that made the bulk of the work of the St. John's Bible come to life on the page. You can learn more about the St. John's Bible by visiting our website. If you wish to learn about the preservation work that Himmel does with manuscripts around the world, please visit hmml.org and please consider becoming one of our donors. Thank you.